Hello, I'm Dr Richard Milne and uh, in this talk I want to take you on a journey through the remarkable world of rhododendrons. Now there is far, far more to this remarkable genus of plants than just being beautiful garden plants, although they are very, very beautiful garden plants. So we're going to be looking at stories from science, from horticulture, from cultures around the world, and uh, also from medicine. Uh, because uh, rhododendrons, um, beautiful though they are, they have very frequently been associated with death in uh, folk tales, in British literature, and uh, they also have been used as weapons of war, both in reality and in myth. And uh, there's two things that a lot of people think they know about rhododendrons. They're from the Himalayas, aren't they? And they're invasive. Well, some of them are from the Himalayas, but not all. And only one of them is invasive. And that particular rhododendron does not come from the Himalayas. So uh, hopefully this will be uh, interesting for you. And uh, we're going to see some very, very surprising stories. I want you to imagine that you are alone in a foreign land. You are trapped in a huge, steep-sided valley clothed in thick, barely penetrable vegetation. You are being hunted by a large number of murderers intent on adding you to their tally. You've eaten nothing but a handful of dried peas for a week. Your bare feet are caked in mud and blood since you pierced one of them on a bamboo spike. You are so delirious with hunger that you stagger to a local village in the faint hope of finding food, expecting to die in the attempt. Your name is George Forrest and you are a rhododendron hunter. George Forrest was an Edinburgh man. He had been recruited as a commercial plant collector after a brief stint at the Edinburgh Botanic Garden Herbarium. And now, not long into his very first trip to China, he was staying in a Catholic mission in Yunnan, near the Tibetan border, unaware of the terrible dangers bearing down upon him, because Tibet had risen in revolt. The normally peaceful people had been driven to terrible acts of violence by years of uh, mistreatment by both the Chinese and the British. And now they were out for blood, slaughtering anyone they perceived as an enemy in really gruesome ways. They were approaching the mission. The message reached them uh, very late in the day of, of the coming danger. And then a desperate moonlight flight which ensued. There was the two Catholic priests, about a hundred people who had been staying there, women and children, plus Forrest and his collectors. And they all walked desperately trying to get to safety along mountain paths in the middle of the night. But they passed a village. Someone in the party made a sound. But someone in the village heard it and the message went to the Tibetans. And now the pursuit was on. It continued through the next day. But at some point, one of the priests looked back and saw their mission, their home, in flames. And it seems to have broken their spirit. They sat down as if waiting to die. And Forrest, in desperation, he ran up the nearest hill to see how close the pursuers were, desperate to do something, and he saw that they were almost upon the party. He shouted a warning, and this enabled some of his collectors to get away. But for the rest of the party, they were doomed. The uh, Tibetans fell upon them, and they were slaughtered. And so began Forrest's eight days on his own, with no food, nothing but his rifle. He, he got rid of his shoes pretty quickly because the distinctive treads would have allowed the pursuers to track him. And at one point, two poison arrows passed through his hat. He speared his foot on a bamboo and uh, was limping thereafter. At one point, it seems that an image of one of the priests appeared high above him, directing him to safety. Was it that one of the priests had temporarily evaded the captors for a few days, or was it a phantom? We don't really know. But after eight days, when he'd eaten nothing but a few dried peas he'd found by the path, he was so hungry he had no choice but to stagger to the nearest village. He thought they'd probably give him up, 
that he'd probably be killed, but he was going to die anyway, so he had to risk it. And the head man of the village decided to look after him, and Forrest called him the best friend he ever had. He smuggled Forrest to safety at some danger to himself, and Forrest breathed again. Now, perhaps the most remarkable thing about George Forrest is not just that he survived this experience, it's that it didn't put him off. Once he'd uh, recovered, he continued his plant collecting exploits in China, mainly in Yunnan, which is where most of the rhododendrons are. And he would go on to introduce about a hundred species of rhododendron into cultivation, many of which can still be seen in the Edinburgh Botanic Gardens. Indeed, many of the plants there were actually brought by Forrest himself. Even as he was bringing back all of these rhododendrons, Forrest was never satisfied. He wanted to bring back more. He wanted to find more. And uh, well, in fact, he was standing in the centre of diversity for rhododendron. There's nowhere in the world with more rhododendron diversity than Yunnan. However, he had come to believe that there would be even greater diversity in the mountains to the north of himself. And uh, he called this place the home of the rhododendrons. And he was one of the first people to really think about the origin and diversification of a plant group, because he believed that rhododendrons had originated on this mountain to the north and diversified there, spreading out. And that's why they became progressively less diverse as you moved southwards and westwards. Um, and yes, then they call this place the home of the rhododendrons, uh, an almost mythical sort of uh, name for it which is ironic because it was another myth that prevented him from getting there. And here we must talk about his collecting team. They were more than just a bunch of underlings. They were drawn from the local Naxi minority, a very interesting group of people. And here we can see uh, 10 of his team, uh, and there among them is Lao Shao. And he was very much the uh, leader of the group and Forrest's deputy. And I think Forrest probably regarded him as an equal. And very rightly so, because many of the plants Forrest brought back, it was actually the team who went and got them. They, their um, culture gives them an incredibly intimate collection with the land, enabling them to go and find maybe one particular shrub of one particular kind of rhododendron. Oh yes, here's one, we've got one we, you haven't seen before. We'll go and get it for you, shall we? Forrest may have never seen some of the species he introduced in the wild. His collectors will have gone and got them for him. So these people were incredibly useful to the forest, indeed essential to him. And yet their religion had this one negative effect that it prevented him from ever reaching the place that he thought was the home of the rhododendrons. Now, the culture of the Naxi people may have been very helpful to Forrest, but their Dongba religion rather got in his way uh, for the simple reason that the area to the north of Yunnan that he was desperate to visit, the collectors, they weren't going to go there. No, no, sir, we're not going there. For the simple reason that they believed it to be the gateway to the land of the dead. They believed that this particular gateway to the afterlife sat between three huge plants of rhododendron decorum and the northern mountain that Forrest was so desperate to get to, and consequently he never did. The legends of the Dongba are full of rhododendrons and they concern the epic battles between the heroic Du and the evil monstrous Su. Uh, Sue is said to have landed on Shiloh Mountain, which is the one that's the gateway to the land of the death. And they both summoned great armies to fight, some of them drawn from the plants around them. And very much thanks to a great collector called Joseph Rock, who came uh, a few decades after Forrest, we actually know the identity of the three main rhododendrons that take part in these legends. The most important one, the black rhododendron, is rhododendron decorum, 
then there's the white rhododendron, rhododendron rubiginosum, and finally rhododendron agdenogynum is the great rhododendron. And all of these are playing supporting roles in these legends. There were warriors making short sword sheaths out of the black rhododendron or being commanded to cut their armour from the great rhododendron. In one case, 10,000 shields and plates of armour were supposed to be carved from just three plants of the great rhododendron. Now, these epic battles ended finally when Du slew his enemy, Su. But because Su was so terribly, terribly evil, and they were desperate to stop him coming back, his body was dismembered and the parts were spread far and wide across the landscape. But every place where a piece of him fell or was laid, it is said to have brought forth evil. Animals for animals, beast for beast, bird for bird, even the plants got involved in fighting one another and soldiers had their weapons trying to fight them. A piece was placed among black rhododendrons on a hilltop and it is said that 10,000 sword sheaths sprang forth from this black rhododendrons and began to fight one another. Now all of these incredible stories are uh, recorded in books and uh, these books uh, are written in the only hieroglyphic language that is still in use anywhere in the world today. Each new book produced is not a copy, it's a retelling. So they, the people, they don't copy these books word for word. Each uh, scribe retells the story. So the stories evolve like a vocal tradition, even though they are written down. And they have a practical purpose because stories from these uh, great legends are read out during Naxi Dongba rituals. They have various kinds of rituals, often to purify a house or to cast out an evil spirit. And for these rituals, they use special torches called Soshua and uh, little mannequin figures and some of those involve rhododendrons as well so this is one that I sort of built myself from British plants but uh, it just sort of to sort of give you the idea of the sort of things so if they were torch obviously they would be uh, lit with smoke coming off them uh, but uh, if they were these mannequins well what happened to them would very much depend on what they were trying to do and what the mannequins were said to represent if it was something positive then the mannequin would be treated well if it was something destructive some evil force that they want to uh, cast out of their lives <coughs> Brexit uh, then the mannequin would come to a terrible end and black rhododendrons were often used in making them and there are even ones called Uncle Rhododendron Man and Auntie Rhododendron Woman. So, for very different reasons, both George Forrest and his collectors believed that Rhododendron had originated on this mountain in the north of Yunnan. But we now know from scientific evidence that that's definitely not the case. Uh, for the simple reason that the genus Rhododendron has actually been around for quite a bit longer than the Himalaya mountains. So we can start our story of Rhododendrons about 90 million years ago, at the height of the age of the dinosaurs. And at this point, a particular plant developed a new way to interact with fungi. Now, mycorrhiza, uh, and the association with fungi of the roots of plants, that's probably been around since the first land plant or very soon after. The fungus and the plant work very well together, the fungus extracting nutrients and the plant giving up some of the energy that it produces abundantly with its leaves. But the ancestor of the Ericaceae, which uh, looked a bit like um, the modern plant Epacris, this managed to evolve a new association with a much wider range of fungi that made it 
through this teamwork, much more efficient at drawing nutrients out of the soil than other competing plants. And uh, it then gradually diversified to give us all of the family Ericaceae that we see today. And it's this relationship that makes members of the Ericaceae so very efficient at living and thriving in environments that are poor in nutrients. As you see moorlands covered in heather and we see rhododendrons all over the place in China where nutrients are hard to get. And it's this relationship with fungi that makes them so good at it. Now, about 30 years after the first Ericaceae, we see fossils of the first recognisable rhododendron. And uh, the thing that makes it most plausible that it's a rhododendron is the pollen of rhododendron. It's quite different from the pollen of most plants. What did this first rhododendron look like? Well, we don't really know, not precisely. We don't have fossils of the entire plant. But what we can look at is the first rhododendron, first living rhododendron group to branch off the rhododendron phylogeny, the rhododendron family tree, and that is Rhododendron Kamchaticum. It's a very low growing sort of creeping shrub. You can see it in the Botanic Gardens. It flowers in June. And it's a very beautiful plant, actually, but it's much, much shorter than any other rhododendrons we see today. Now, what's not quite clear is that whether the first rhododendron looked like that or whether Kamchaticum has specialised into to become small afterwards. We don't quite know. But nonetheless, that is the first rhododendron, the one that's least um, related to all the others. Now, the rest of rhododendron, there's over a thousand species and they are grouped into large and small groupings, um, first of all by morphology and latterly by DNA. And this work is still ongoing using DNA to try and work out how they're all related to one another. And it's very, very complicated for reasons we'll get to later. Uh, I'm even involved in a paper now trying to sort this out but there's still some way to go but here's what we think we know so the first major subgroup is subgenus rhododendron now this includes quite an eclectic group of things including the famous alpenrose of the alps so let's put this into the family tree and uh, next let's consider something that until recently, wasn't even placed in rhododendron. It um, was the genus Ledum, these beautiful white flower things that occur in bogs and uh, pine woods in the far northern hemisphere. Uh, these were actually shown to be very, very closely related to subgenus rhododendron. And then we have another large group, the viraeas. Now these are beautiful tropical plants. Most of them are in fact epiphytic and they were previously thought very, very distinct from the rest of rhododendron. But it turns out that they are actually a specialised offshoot from within subgenus rhododendron. So these evolved quite recently and invaded the tropics of Southeast Asia. Our next large subgroup are the Sutsuzi azaleas. Now these are mainly Japanese um, spreading into China, some of them. And these um, branched away from the ancestors of subgenus rhododendron somewhere between 24 and 36 million years ago. And then there's a few sort of odds and ends that um, don't really fit neatly with any, any other group. There's Rhododendron slip and barky eyes, beautiful plant from the northeast of Asia. So that fits onto the tree like so. We have Rhododendron semibarbatum placed in a subgenus entirely on its own. This um, fits on, we're not quite sure how, but um, that's it's sort of somewhere branching off quite early and we've got another thing that used to be placed in a completely separate genus Menzesia that's it uh, was the genus Menzesia but DNA evidence has shown you can see it looks nothing like a rhododendron actually the flowers look more like an erica they're kind of egg-shaped but 
they are, according to DNA, they are rhododendrons. They just, the flowers must have come under intense selective pressure to change their structure to uh, adapt to a different pollinator. And so they fit on the tree here as well, uh, coming off quite early. Now our final really large group are the Hymenanthes rhododendrons. This subgenus, this contains the things with really big evergreen leaves and generally large flowers. These are the things that you know, people most usually think of when you say rhododendron. And so they fit onto the tree here. They branched away from the subgenus rhododendron between about 21 and 33 million years ago. In fact, most of the really large roots <coughs> in rhododendron branched apart in just a, a period of about 7 million years, which is fast in evolutionary terms. We don't know exactly which 7 million years because different methods give you different dates, but they still agree that there was this really fast process of going from just two lineages in the genus to about 12. And finally, we have the Pentanthera azaleas. Uh, these are deciduous, they're mainly American, but there's the, the yellow azalea from uh, Southeast Europe and Turkey and uh, one in China and Japan as well. And these turn out to be uh, the sister group of the uh, evergreen subgenus Hymenanthes. So, so these uh, were one of the last pairs of major groups to come apart. So there you can see a very, very simplified family tree of rhododendron. There's a lot of little bits and pieces I haven't included there, but it gives you some idea of the uh, complexity of the genus. So Ledum and Menzesia were merged into rhododendron. But what about Azalea? It's a very, very familiar name. Yet all the plants that horticulturalists refer to as azaleas, scientists would say are rhododendrons. If you have a look at the uh, family tree here, you'll see that there's two major groups of azaleas, the Pentanthera azaleas and the Tsutsuzi azaleas. So how does this happen that some rhododendrons are referred to by horticulturalists as azaleas? Well, it all starts with Linnaeus, the father of taxonomy and modern botanical naming. Now, he had a system, and his, his system was all about how many sex organs you had. And basically, if a plant had five stamens, it couldn't be in the same genus as another that had ten stamens. And in front of him, he had eleven species of, that were rhododendron-like, and six of them had five stamens each per flower. And you can see them here. Um, five of them are still regarded as being in the genus Rhododendron now. One has been moved to the genus Calmia. And then he had another five plants that had ten stamens per flower. So he described the ones with five stamens per flower as azalea. He described the ones with ten stamens per flower as Rhododendron. And so that was how things started. And more plants came in. They were classified into one genus or the other, depending how many stamens they had. But especially as more species came in from Japan of the Tsutsuzi group, this distinction started to fall down because there are members of the Tsutsuzi group with five stamens and members with ten but they are very, very similar in all other characteristics. And the more of these species came in, the more clear it became that rhododendron and azalea could not really be held separately. There were deciduous and evergreen things with five stamens. There were deciduous and evergreen things with ten stamens. There just isn't a clear dividing line. There was a period of botanical ping-pong when some botanists were merging all the azaleas into rhododendron and others were trying to keep azalea going by, by, by describing new azaleas and re-describing rhododendrons as azaleas. But now we have a consensus that all, rhododendron, all azaleas are rhododendrons.
Now, this uh, disagreement between horticulturalists and scientists over what to call azaleas has sometimes spilled over into the wider world. There was a case of two neighbours. They had inherited a pair of houses with a stipulation that the rhododendrons that separated the two properties were not to be removed. But one of the neighbours just said, no, no, they're not the rhododendrons, they're azaleas, therefore I can cut them all down. And uh, the rhododendron expert, Dr David Chamberlain, had to be called upon to adjudicate and to inform them that azaleas are technically rhododendrons and scientifically there's no such thing as an azalea. So the plants were saved. David also tells another story of how he got a call from the police down in England saying that they'd found a body under some rhododendrons and they wanted to know if the body had been moved or not. Could he come down, identify the rhododendron species and have a look at the pollen on the body to see if it was from the same plant? So up he gets onto a train, down he comes to uh, London and across to where the body had been found, takes one look at the uh, plants above the body. They're not rhododendrons, sir, they're cherry laurels. And uh, back he goes, the police left with a little bit of egg on their faces by that one. Now, the rhododendrons in that particular story may have been innocent, but there are many, many tales scattered around the Northern Hemisphere where rhododendrons are associated with death and misery. And one example is the classic Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. This is the story of a uh, young woman who is haunted by the spectre of her new husband's first wife, Rebecca. And it's made all the worse by a very, very vindictive housekeeper called Mrs Danvers. And the, the action play, takes place at this huge house called Manderley. But a lot of the uh, sort of dark, brooding atmosphere built up in the book concerns the giant rhododendron plants that grow around the grounds of Manderley. And so I'm going to read you a short bit from the book just as she approaches Manderley for the first time. We were amongst the rhododendrons. There was something bewildering even shocking about the suddenness of their discovery. The woods had not prepared me for them. They startled me with their crimson faces, massed one upon the other in incredible profusion, showing no leaf, no twig, nothing but the slaughterous red, luscious and fantastic, unlike any rhododendron plant I had seen before. And then a few lines later, to me... A rhododendron was a homely, domestic thing, strictly conventional, mauve or pink in colour, standing one beside the other in a neat round bed. And these were monsters, rearing to the sky, massed like a battalion, too beautiful, I thought, too powerful. They were not plants at all. The word mast is used repeatedly in this book uh, concerning rhododendrons to sort of emphasise the sinister nature of these giant red-flowered rhododendrons. And uh, there's a moment later on in the book where ro the, the rhododendrons are said to have invaded the house because the housekeeper, probably sensing the narrator is uneasy about the rhododendrons, has picked a whole load of uh, bright red inflorescences and put them in water by her room. In Nepal, uh, Rhododendron arboreum, which is pink, deep pink to red flowered, is the national flower of the country. And there is a folk tale about it. It concerns the alder tree, who's said to be male, and the rhododendron, who's said to be female. And the rhododendron uh, finds the alder attractive, and she asks him if he would like to marry her. But the alder looks to her and says, mm, no, you, you're spindly and untidy. I, I, I'm too good for you, basically. And the rhododendron um, 
in a very modern way says oh right yeah whatever and she gets on with her life uh, forget the nasty man he's not worth worrying about and in due course she bursts into beautiful bloom as her flowers open and the alder suddenly think oh 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 wow she's actually really gorgeous so he sidles up to her and says Oh, guess what? I've changed my mind. Actually, you can marry me if you really, really want to. And she says, Nope, you have shown your true nature. I will never marry you. Well done, her. The alder is so distraught at this rejection that he throws himself into a deep gorge and kills himself. And this, it is said, is why all the trees in Nepal are always found on the steep edges of gorges. The place where you find the most stories about rhododendron is uh, western China, especially Yunnan, the centre of diversity for rhododendron, the genus itself. We've already seen how uh, they've worked their way into Dongba myths and religion, but they also uh, have a very modern significance. For example, there are streetlights in the city of Baiji celebrating the magnificent red-flowered rhododendron Dectelaveae. And uh, this is related to the nearby Baili scenic area, which is actually a pretty major tourist destination in China, uh, largely because of the huge populations of rhododendron delavei, rhododendron iruratum and their hybrids, creating a spectrum of pink, white and red flowers for a few weeks every year. And this is quite uh, well celebrated in the area. Uh, there's uh, the statue of the rhododendron goddess. You can see she's uh, standing on a pile of flowering rhododendrons. And there's even a massive symbol uh, for rhododendrons carved into this huge cliff face. It's chi the Chinese answer to the Hollywood symbol. And once a year, they have a great big... Uh, festival to celebrate the flowering of these rhododendrons and uh, imaginary pigs are sacrificed to the gods of Yi. They're singing, there's dancing and it's all very jolly. The stories themselves very often will involve the uh, dujuan or cuckoo bird as well. Now this bird is associated with the rhododendrons because it tends to be a pollinator, especially for rhododendron uh, delabei. Uh, birds tend to go for red, large flowers. The name Dujuan is said to come from a good king, Duju, who uh, helped his people through a flood. Uh, the stories differ in uh, the eventual fate of the king, but it's said that he transformed into one of these birds and then continued flying around his kingdom. And so the bird is called the Dujuan bird, and the rhododendron is often called Dujuan hua, or uh, cuckoo flower, because of the association with the bird. One particular story concerns a beautiful young woman called Miyulu, now she is coerced by threats against her family to come into the clutches of a corrupt local official with a history of preying on vulnerable young women. Um, but she puts a white rhododendron flower in her hair as she goes to meet him. And uh, when his attention is momentarily distracted, she squeezes a drop of juice from the flower into the wine bottle. Uh, which he then pours, and because uh, he wants to have a drink before doing anything else. And she has to drink as well, because uh, otherwise he had become suspicious. And they both die from the poison. So she has sacrificed her life to free her town of this awful predator. Her lover, Zhao Lurai, arrives too late to do anything about it, and he bears her lifeless body through the hillsides where they used to walk together, crying tears of blood. And in this case, the tears of blood turn the rhododendrons from white to red, which they remain in her memory. And her sacrifice is indeed celebrated by a festival on the 8th of February every year. Now, it is true that rhododendrons are fairly poisonous, some more than others, but you certainly won't die from eating a single flower. In fact, uh, if you choose 
wisely, some of the flowers are actually edible. Generally speaking, the flowers are the least defended part of a plant. The petals, they only last for a few days. It's generally not worth the plant's energy to protect them by putting poison into them. So in many, not all, but many plants, even if the leaves are poisonous, then the flowers may not be. And consequently, there's places in China where you can get soup made from rhododendron flowers, including, I think, rhododendron decorum, the black rhododendron. Now, moving back to Nepal, the national flower is rhododendron arboreum, and uh, the flowers of this are not really poisonous at all, and consequently they are used in all manner of uh, cuisine. They're used to make chutneys, they're used to make drinks. It's a kind of uh, it's a traditional thing that people do there. There are, however, species that are far more poisonous. For example, rhododendron molly, the uh, Chinese and Japanese uh, azalea. Now, this is so poisonous that, in fact, they are looking at trying to extract poisons from it and grow it as a source of a natural insecticide. So how poisonous are rhododendrons? Yeah, well, it does, as I say, it varies quite a lot between species. Um, there's some things where well, the leaves are generally the most poisonous part. But even so, um, in times of hardship in Nepal, people do sometimes eat the very young leaves of uh, rhododendron arboreum. Now, there's one case of uh, somebody being uh, mildly poisoned by eating rhododendron flowers, and this was uh, Francis Kingdon Ward, another of the truly great uh, explorers of the uh, botanical world. Uh, he, his uh, collecting career spanned about 50 years. He collected in China, in Nepal, all around the Himalayas. And what's really remarkable about him is that he had two rather serious drawbacks for a, um, an explorer. He had absolutely no sense of direction and he was terrified of heights. And yet his drive to explore overcame both of these. Uh, but it was the uh, lack of sense of direction that ended up with him getting a bit of rhododendron poisoning. He had um, left the path uh, on one occasion to uh, collect plants, which uh, I know all about. I do that a lot myself. But having no sense of direction, he couldn't get back to the path. He ended up going somewhere completely different and he was separated from the rest of his party for a full 24 hours, very hungry, extremely thirsty, and in desperation, he ended up eating the flowers from a particular rhododendron. And this was one of the mildly poisonous species. And he, he got a rather nasty stomachache. He was very, very successful as an explorer, despite these drawbacks. Um, he uh, discovered and brought back rhododendron macabianum, one of the really huge flowered species. Um, and he's probably best known for having been the first, um, at least the first Westerner, and quite possibly the first human being ever, to have made the full journey down the Sangpo Brahmaputra gorges. So the Sangpo is a river in Tibet, and it had long been suspected that it became the Brahmaputra River in Bangladesh. But nobody was sure, because in between lay these chasms of um, gorges, um, virtually unnavigable within the Himalayas and uh, he took it upon himself to travel the full length of these gorges and um, collected many plants on the way and proved that the two rivers were one and the same. Now throughout human history poisonous plants have been used uh, time and again to treat all manner of different ailments, uh, the foxglove for heart conditions, um, antimalarials like quinine and recently taxol from the extremely poisonous yew tree is being used to treat cancer. So poisons, if used carefully, can be med medically very useful. And rhododendrons are poisonous, they occur all around the northern hemisphere and looking between different cultures, they have been used for a quite extraordinary range of different ailments. So let's have a look at um, some of them. Diarrhea, 
diabetes, heart problems, blood pressure, liver disease, wounds, skin problems, bronchitis, nosebleeds, headaches, flagging sex drive, malaria, ulcers, birth complications, coughs, colds, rheumatism, syphilis, gonorrhea, leukaemia, sciatica, leprosy, fish bones stuck in the throat, and red spot disease in pigs. So rhododendrons, yeah, as well as all this cultural importance and of course recent horticultural importance, they've actually had a quite significant medical role during human history. And probably the single one that has been used the most, um, partly because it's so very widespread, is the ledum, now sort of rhododendron tomentosum. The most psychotropically active uh, part of um, many rhododendron plants is actually the nectar. Uh, in many rhododendron species, the nectar contains substantial quantities of poisons called guayanotoxins. And to give you an example of what these can do, let me tell you a tale of a group of horticulturalists. They went to Inverview Garden in northwest Scotland and they were photographing the beautiful rhododendrons there. And um, one of them had separated from the group um, to photograph close up the flowers of um, a cultivar called Lady Chamberlain, which is largely de derived from rhododendron cinnabarinum. I don't have a picture of Lady Ch Chamberlain, but rhododendron cinnabarinum, it's a very, very beautiful plant. It actually comes from the uh, uh, gorge. Uh, where uh, Kingdom Ward did his great adventure. But it's also one of the most poisonous rhododendrons in the world. And the horticulturalist was going right up close with his camera. And as he did so, a couple of tiny drops of nectar fell onto his hand. And without thinking, he licked them off. He realised almost immediately that he had made a terrible mistake. To start with, he just got a feeling of pins and needles and tingling on his tongue, but soon he was having trouble walking uh, and speaking. He couldn't alert the rest of his group. He just about managed to make it to a bench. He felt a huge depression sweeping across him, a sense of utter, utter dread. And then he found himself sort of floating in space, powerless to act. And uh, he was unconscious in this form for about 20 minutes. And finally, he sort of um, returned to some semblance of consciousness. And he managed to stagger off, find his friends. Um, he couldn't even speak properly. He said, I've done a random poisoning. And they managed to work out what had happened. Uh, they got him lying down. They gave him a lot of water. He had a terrible headache for a while, but otherwise uh, he did fully recover. He was a rare British case of what is uh, called in Turkey mad honey disease. Um, basically, if you eat the wrong kind of raw honey that's got granar toxins in it, you will suffer from this kind of uh, sickness. And uh, yeah, it does wear off. It doesn't leave long term effects. Record records of this go back to 400 BC. The Greek historian Xenophon records how uh, 10,000 Greeks were passing through the uh, land of Colchis. And they were hungry. They stopped to uh, rob some beehives and they wolfed down the honey. But the honey had been made from rhododendron nectar. And consequently, they all they were they were vomiting. They were passing out. And in Xenophon's words, a great despondency fell across them all. The locals, very wisely, left them alone and in time they recovered and went on their way, lesson learned. As well as um, going around peddling drugs to human beings, cows and other animals, rhododendrons also are extremely sexually promiscuous. A species of rhododendron will typically be capable of forming hybrids with other species, uh, even sometimes things that they're separated from by as many as 20 million years of evolution. For example, this here is a photograph of uh, an azalea dendron. This is a hybrid between the um, dis deciduous um, Pentanthra azalea group and the evergreen Hymenanthes group. 
So these are very, very different in appearance, and yet they manage sometimes to produce hybrids. And this has been particularly happening in cultivation. It happens in the wild as well, but um, cultivated rhododendrons are very, very prone to uh, hybridizing. And to see why that is, um, we need to think a bit about how uh, sex happens in plants. So there's three, you could divide sort of plant sort of um, breeding into three categories. You can have self-fertilization, whereby the pollen of an individual plant fertilizes that same plant. And so basically it's breeding with itself. And that, gen that is not generally good for the plant. It, it causes immediate inbreeding, lots of homozygosity, and, it, and it's prone to uh, causing genetic defects to appear. So the uh, best form of outcross of uh, breeding is outcrossing. And that's where an individual successfully interbreeds with another member of its own species, um, promoting sort of genetic diversity within the population and genetic health of the immediate offspring. But then you can also have hybridization, which is like outcrossing, except that you're breeding with members of a different species instead of your own species. So generally speaking, natural selection will cause things to evolve towards outcrossing and um, evolve mechanisms to prevent both selfing and hybridization. Now, how do rhododendrons um, achieve outcrossing? Well, um, there's a bit of it in the design of a flower. So what you can see here as a, it's actually a rhododendron hybrid itself. But the point is, look at the insect, look at the pollinator, and it's landed on the female organ, the uh, stigma and the style. And in the process of landing, it will have already deposited pollen onto the stigma, the pollen catching organ at the end. And uh, that pollen will have come from another flower. And only after it lands will it crawl upwards towards the nectar, which is what it's gone come there for. And if you look closely, you can see pollen strings were already hanging off some of those flowers, and those are going to get onto the insect, and it will carry it off towards the next flower. All well and good. However, there's a slight snag here, which is that if you're a rhododendron, you don't produce one flower at once. You produce hundreds of flowers at once. And so the insect is likely to fly off to another flower of the same individual. And that is still self-fertilization. You're still getting pollen from the same genetic individual. And, and consequently, you'll get inbreeding. So rhododendron, like many other species and genera of plants, has evolved mechanisms to um, favour pollen from other individuals over pollen of the same individual. Now that's all very well, uh, but in doing so, in sort of selecting against selfing, it also renders itself more prone to hybridization, particularly if as very often happens in gardens, especially botanic gardens, if there's only one individual of a particular rhododendron species present, then it has only two ways that it can make seed. One is to self-fertilize and the other is to hybridize. And if the genetic mechanisms um, against selfing are stronger than the ones against pollen from another species, then a lot of the seed produced is actually going to be hybrid. Now, initially, this uh, tendency of rhododendrons to hybridize when grown in cultivation may have been caused quite a bit of uh, consternation to a lot of horticulturalists. Why aren't they coming true from seed? Indeed, there's a true story of a French horticulturalist who um, illegally took seeds from many of the rhododendrons in Edinburgh Botanic Garden Grew, the, grew up the plants from these seeds and then wrote very audaciously to the keeper saying, these three old rhododendrons are wrongly labelled. They don't come true. The things I'm growing up are not the things that your label said they were. And of course, the reason for that was that most of the seed was hybridised. However, 
this um, tendency to hybridize was soon turned to the advantage, the great advantage of gardeners everywhere as um, horticulturalists um, started deliberately crossing species together. And this was the work of the great waterer horticultural dynasty and the Veitch horticultural dynasty. And uh, one of the uh, plants that they produced was the rhododendron cultivar Pink Pearl. Now this is the most commercially successful rhododendron cultivar of all time. It's like the Titanic or Avatar of movies. Um, just you know, a real blockbuster moneymaker of a plant. The very first individual of it was um, bred by John Waterer and then one day it disappeared. He's like, oh my god, it's gone! The best plant ever bred, it's gone! And what it was, was that one of his employees thought, oh, that's nice, and took taking it home and planted it in his own garden. And so Waterer and um, his friends had to go around all their employees until finally they found the plant and gently took it back into cultivation. Of course, uh, because they don't come true from seed, and uh, hybrids don't even if you self-fertilise them, the uh, pink pearl has been uh, propagated by cloning ever since and that's how it comes to have been sold as millions and millions of individuals. This diagram here, it shows the genealogy of Pink Pearl. It is a hybrid uh, second generation between probably four different species. I say probably, so you can see here there's a few question marks in this genealogy. Now Pink Pearl itself is in the second row, uh, second from the left. And you can see its immediate parents are two other hybrids, Brautonii and George Hardy. Now, George Hardy is a hybrid of two species, Griffithianum and Catorbiensi. Brautonii is Arboreum and we don't know. The reason we don't know is that growers like John Waterer often were very, very secretive about how exactly they had managed to develop that particular cultivar and consequently some of the parentage is not recorded. But as well as Pink Pearl being a success in its own right, you can see it has um, in turn fathered uh, more hybrids. There's just two there, Countess of Derby and Goma Waterer, and they themselves um, have um, given rise to at least two more generations. Rhododendrons also hybridise in the wild, not quite as much as they do in cultivation, but still a lot more than most other types of plants do. And uh, I saw this for myself when I visited northeast Turkey, part of the native range of Rhododendron ponticum. In this photo you can see uh, the yellow azalea, Rhododendron luteum, and uh, the pink plants are actually Rhododendron smirnovii, another uh, hymenanthi species. But uh, I became particularly interested in these large populations of a hybrid called Rhododendron X Socadzi. Now this was known to be a hybrid between Rhododendron ponticum and Rhododendron caucasicum. And it forms large populations across a very narrow altitudinal band. You've got caucasicum up at the top and ponticum down at the bottom and Sokhadzi in this little band in between. And so it's clearly occupying an intermediate climatic zone between the parents. But um, when I sort of returned from my first trip out there and started reading about hybridization in the wild, I discovered that what normally happens uh, when plants hybridize in the wild was totally not what I was seeing in Rhododendron ex Sokhadzi. So typically what happens is all hybridization events begin with an F1. That's the first generation cross between two species. It always starts that way. But once you've got a single F1 hybrid, then any offspring that it produces will be hybrid in some form. It can breed with itself, it can breed with other hybrids, or it can breed with one or other of the parents to produce a back cross. Whatever route it takes, the next generation that it produces will all be hybrid in form. What is more, um, these barriers towards hybridization that I mentioned, the, the uh, 
preference for pollen of the same species when it's available means that F1 formation is generally quite a rare event, even in rhododendrons. So, you know, you get very occasional F1s, typically, and then once you've got an F1, it will sire a whole dynasty of hybrids, and you can often get these what are called hybrid swarms with very few F1s, but lots and lots and lots of variation in the appearance of the hybrids because each of them, other than the F1, and F1 has a complete set of genes from each parent, but all the subsequent generations will just have a completely random selection of genes from each of the two parent species. And each individual will have a different set of genes from the next one. So uh, a gene for red colour, it might be in this individual, but not in that individual. And so they'd have different coloured flowers, even though they're both half one species and half the other. And so you get this incredible variation of form across these hybrid swarm populations. And because quite often the hybrids back cross with one or other parents, you'll also see that the morphology grades into the two parents. So it's not a sudden demarcation between a parent and a hybrid. You'll see this is definitely a parent. This looks a bit like a hybrid. This is definitely a parent. This looks a bit like a hybrid. That's definitely a hybrid. This one is starting to grade into the other parent species. And so it's everything sort of mixed together. However, in these populations of rhododendrons of Cadsey, what I'd seen out there was completely different. There were tons and tons of hybrid. They were separate habitat from either of the parents. There was very little variation. All of the hybrids looked fairly similar to one another and they were clearly distinguished from the parents. So there were no sort of, there appeared to be no back crosses at all. Now I thought, well, this must be a hybrid species. So sometimes a hybrid is not a species, but from a hybrid, sometimes by a few generations of natural selection, a hybrid can become a true breeding species. I thought that's what happened. I wrote a grant proposal and uh, a few years later I returned to Turkey armed with grant money and there I am standing by my hired car carrying half my own body weight in um, equipment, clothes, food and such like. And uh, so I walked up the mountain. I'd driven as far as it was possible to go and then... I actually stayed in this uh, shepherd's hut at about 2,100 metres, uh, sleeping under a couple of Turkish blankets, cooking on a very simple camping stove. It was a very, very remote existence. And uh, while I was there, I came across quite a few very, very exciting plants. Um, this thing here, Rhodothamnus sessilifolius, it's one of the rarest plants in the world. It had been seen twice in this general area, uh, but at but more than 40 years ago, and nobody had found it since. They didn't even know if it was still there. And myself and my Turkish colleague, Sally Terzioglu, we rediscovered it. Epigea gaultherioides with a very interesting distribution. Uh, but my job was to uh, examine these hybrids. So I, every day I would walk up to the top of the hill and collect the alpine parent, Rhododendron caucasicum. Then I'd walk down the hill to collect the other parent, Rhododendron ponticum, and then up back to the middle, <coughs> by which time I had living um, plants of um, just shoots of ponticum, shoots of caucasicum, and then I could conduct pollination experiments on the plants of Rhododendron sarcadzi. So I wanted to know, are they interfertile with the parents? Do they breed true? Are they, are they fertile at all? And there are various possibilities for what could be causing this strange pattern. It could be that they always self-fertilised. As I say, it could be they'd become a uh, separate species. They might have undergone a, undergone a chromosome doubling event. Uh, or what seemed very unlikely to me, they could all be first generation hybrids. So that was all done. Um, and then I had to bag up all of the uh, flowers that I pollinated because I had to leave them on the plants to produce seeds if they were going to. And then I had to come back in the autumn. I had to guess the re week that the um, seed pods would be right. And miraculously, I guessed correctly. And here I am with a few uh, Turkish um, colleagues um, going up there to collect all of those seeds and take them all home 
and we were treated to this incredible display of crocus, literally probably millions and millions of them just carpeting the entire hillside. It was a sight I'll never forget. So there were two strands to it. First of all, I had to see if the seeds would germinate, and they did. They all germinated. Whatever the parent was, these were highly fertile hybrids capable of backcrossing to either parent species. Okay, so they weren't sterile, they were fertile, and there was nothing preventing them from backcrossing with the parents. Then I looked at the DNA, comparing these um, Zocadze hybrids with the two parents. And uh, here you can see an actual photo of one of my gels. And the point is, there were genetic markers from Caucasicum, there were genetic markers from Ponticum. And uh, in a first generation hybrid, you would expect all genetic markers from each of the parent species to be present. In a second generation or a hybrid species, only a proportion of them would be present because um, you know, there would be certain alleles that had been passed on and certain ones not. But what I found was that all of the markers were present, showing that all of these hybrids were first generation. So somehow what's happening was that first generation hybrids were being produced. They were very, very fertile, but the next generation wasn't coming at all. And the only way this could be explained is, is if selection was strongly, strongly favouring the first generation. And uh, researching this, I found that there was one example of the same thing had been seen in a member of the daisy family in the deserts of Baja, California. And so I put these two together and I wrote a paper on it about how these um, first generation hybrids were outcompeting their own offspring. Okay, so that was the story of my own research. And uh, now we're going to move to another story that's linked to my own research and linked to the most notorious rhododendron of them all, Rhododendron ponticum. Now, that many of you will know this plant. Maybe you've even once or twice been involved in a conservation trip with the specific job of ripping them all up. But the thing about Rhododendron ponticum is, uh, you know, it's, it's considered an alien in the British Isles now. And yet, if you go back far enough in time, it isn't. Because um, it used to be native at least in Ireland. We have fossil records for it going back about uh, 400,000 years. It was there in Ireland during one of the interglacial periods. Um, the current distribution of Ponticum as a native, it's mainly around the southern part of the Black Sea. There's also two patches in Portugal and one in southern Spain. But um, extrapolating from what fossils we have and um, the fact that it probably would have moved slowly across land, we can sort of um, postulate what its maximum distribution would have been um, during one of the warmer, wetter interglacials. It likes wet conditions, that's why it's doing so well now in the western British Isles. Um, and so in a suitable interglacial, it probably would have spread across the north coast of the Mediterranean, quite a bit of the Iberian Peninsula, and probably up the west coast of France, and then across the English Channel when it wasn't there, as uh, when the, there was more ice, the English Channel wasn't there, and you could walk across. And so it got across naturally into Ireland about 400,000 years ago. But then it disappeared. The Rhododendron ponticum was wiped out from Ireland, along with most of the other plants there, by the latest advance of the ice sheets. The ice sheets came and went multiple times during the last two and a half million years. But unlike many of the plants, well all of the plants now native to Ireland, it didn't manage to make it back into Ireland during the latest interglacials. It, it spreads relatively slowly, inexorably, but slowly. And so it appears that it just didn't move northwards fast enough to uh, get across the channel before the channel flooded. 
or maybe it just what the conditions weren't right for it to even move from up north from Spain during the current interglacial. So what this means is that it's not so much a total alien in the British flora as a prodigal son returning after a very long time away. However, we must consider that 400,000 years is quite a long time. You only have to go back 125,000 years to a time when things like lions and hippopotamuses were roaming southern Britain as natives. So, yeah, things have changed quite a bit. But when we consider the menace that Ponticum is now, sort of the huge monoculture populations it can form, we have to ask ourselves, would it have been doing that in Ireland when it was there as a native? And the chances are it wasn't. The, there, there isn't in really enough fossil material in the fossil record to suggest that it was there in huge quantities. We can also consider that there were four other species of Ericaceae in uh, Western Ireland that are part of what's called the Lusitanian flora. These are things that are they're in Western Ireland, some of them in Western Scotland, although not these um, Ericaceous things. Um, that it's called Lusitanian because they also occur down the west side of the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal and southwest Spain. And all of these other ericaceous things, there's um, the Debesia cantabrica, there's a couple of species of erica and the strawberry tree Arbutus unido, and none of them are particularly common. Uh, and so Rhododendron ponticum as a native may not have been that abundant either. Um, there's also the enemy release hypothesis, which is if you take a plant from its native range into a new alien range, generally you don't take its natural enemies with it, and consequently the plant has an advantage over native plants. So if you put all those together, We've got reason to believe that Rhododendron ponticum behaves very invasively in Britain now because it's an alien and especially because humans are disturbing the environment in a way that allows it to become more invasive. So having um, failed to reach uh, the British Isles naturally during the most recent current interglacial, it was brought finally from Spain by a gentleman enterprising Dutchman called Conrad Lodiges. Now, when I um, looked for images of this person, I came up with this painting uh, in one of the museums in London, and I asked them if I could have permission to use it in my book and in my talk. And they said, well, you can, but we've just found out that it's probably not him. It's probably actually a uh, clergyman called Reverend Crichton. And yeah, well, looking at the guy's expression, he doesn't look like an entrepreneur or a bit like a sort of expressions you see on Alan Sugar in The Apprentice. But generally, he looks a lot more like a rather grumpy clergyman. So we don't really probably have any pictures of Conrad Lodigius. But nonetheless, he's the guy who brought Rhododendron Ponticum back to the British Isles after about 400,000 years and into cultivation. He brought it from southern Spain, something that I actually was able to prove later on using DNA evidence. And initially, because it, it takes about 12 years to flower, so um, in the early years it was being sold as a dwarf um, sort of little pot plant. They, they could induce it to flower early, but in time it grew to full size and uh, flowered full size in people's gardens. And then it began to seed and seed in considerable quantity. Now initially it was quite an expensive plant to buy and sell but as it, it seeds in huge huge quantities and all these seedlings were coming out absolutely everywhere anywhere it was being grown um, because it was initially an expensive plant everyone all the owners were digging up these seedlings potting them up and selling them to one another. And uh, laws of supply and demand being what they are, the price of rhododendron ponticum plants went down very, very rapidly, almost exponentially, up to down to the point where it was about seven pence a plant at one point, because there was just the market was absolutely being flooded with all of these seedlings. 
rapidly falling prices of plants of Rhododendron ponticum were just one of several factors that made it extremely popular for a time in Victorian uh, period. Also, there was uh, the phenomenon of rhododendromania. So this was a sort of craze sweeping the country for rhododendrons. It was triggered in part by Joseph Hooker, the great botanist. He had been to the Himalayas in the middle of the 1800s and come back with seeds of all manner of fantastic rhododendrons. And this was at the same time as the uh, families like the Waterers were breeding all these amazing new cultivars of rhododendrons. Everybody had to have them. Everyone wanted them. And uh, if you were a bit less well off, well, Ponticum was pretty much the only one that you could afford. Secondly, um, in 1880, there was quite a strong frost, a very bleak winter. It was cold enough to kill off quite a lot of the shrub species that people had been planting, notably Prunus lusitanica. They all died, but the Rhododendron ponticum survived, and so they, they were given a boost by that too. But also, in the second half of the 1800s, there was a huge craze for shooting for uh, toffs to go round shooting pheasants and everything else they could um, get in their sights. And they wanted cover. They wanted to give the birds a sporting chance, you know. We'll plant some shrubby cover and then we'll flush them out of it and shoot them all. And Rhododendron ponticum was planted a lot for cover. There were some... Um, dissenting voices. There are some who say oh, rhododendrons are not very good cover for game birds. But this is an actual quote from the time of somebody who has an alternative view. The mere fact of his lordship having killed 1,367 pheasants, 500 hares besides rabbits in one day in covers abounding in rhododendrons, is evidence that rhododendrons are not disliked by pheasants or hares. So basically, they were being planted in gardens and also in the wild. Uh, in the wild as game cover uh, and for other reasons as well, uh, with the effect that you know, they didn't just escape into the wild. We actually put them there. We actually planted them in the wild in quite a few places. And although they don't dis tend to disperse long distances, they just seed where they've been planted and they slowly spread. So uh, unlike some other invading plants, notably the Oxford ragwort, uh, rhododendrons they tend to only form invading populations near to where it has been planted. But because they've been planted up and down the British Isles, they are now invading all up and down the country, including these populations here, which are climbing up a hillside in Scotland, somewhere really quite cold. Remember, they were brought from southwest Spain. So how are they managing to do so well in cold hillsides in Scotland? Well, the uh, answer may be to do, first of all, with an even harsher winter that hit Britain in 1895. And this was one of the coldest winters ever recorded in human memory in the British Isles. The Thames froze, bulbs were killed in Kew Gardens, death rates soared among the elderly children, and uh, it was a very, very, very tough time. Uh, and although the rhododendron ponticums they had come through the 1880 winter, fine, this winter was even colder, and uh, a lot of the ponticums were killed. But not all, because the Ponticums by this point had a secret weapon. Remember I told you how uh, in cultivation the rhododendrons were crossing with one another, especially where there was only one plant of a particular species present. And Ponticum was no different. It was one of the earlier introductions, but not the earliest, because uh, other species had come in even earlier.
So a Torbiensi had come in a little after Rhododendron Ponticum, but Maximum had, had come before. And, so, and also there was Rhododendron Arboreum, which arrived from uh, India in about 1812. So these were some of the earliest large rhododendrons that were growing in gardens. And first naturally, but also deliberately, rhododendron ponticum was crossing with these. Now ponticum, as you'll see uh, from the British countryside, is a rather vigorous species, highly adapted to growing in the wild in Britain. Catorbiensi and Maximum are much less vigorous, they're less competitive, but they are extremely frost tolerant. They've been shown empirically. They can cope with temperatures down to something like minus 50 degrees centigrade. They are very, very cold tolerant. Rhododendron arboreum, on the other hand, is very, very pretty, but it comes from a subtropical place and consequently it's quite um, delicate, but it is taller. And so you're mixing all these together, both naturally and um, artificially, deliberately, you got a series of what were called the hardy hybrids. And for our story of Rhododendron Ponticum, Catorbiensi is very much the most important. Um, so it was hybridising both deliberately and accidentally with Ponticum. And uh, over many generations, a process called introgression happened. Now this is when you get hybridization followed by repeated crossing of the hybrids towards one of the parent species, in this case Ponticum, with the effect that the genetic material of Torbiensi is diluted and diluted and diluted till you end up with things that look like Rhododendron Ponticum but have a little bit of Torbiensi in them. Now different individuals maybe had different bits of Torbiensi but natural selection can work even in cultivation. And so uh, here, selection would have been acting to increase cold tolerance because Britain's a lot colder than southern Spain. And so genes for cold tolerance in Catorbiensi would have been favoured by natural selection, even in cultivation. And uh, if growers were able to tell which plants were more frost hardy than others from the seedling stage, then they would have added artificial selection onto the natural selection. The outcome of all this was, in 1895, the uh, pure ponticums were being killed, but the hardy hybrids of Torbiensi and ponticum were surviving, as this contemporaneous quote shows us. And if you look at many of our wild, naturalised rhododendron ponticum plants today, you can actually see evidence of this, because along with the cold tolerance, which we think was transferred, we know that a, one morphological character was transferred, which is hairy ovaries. And if you look at this wonderful painting by local artist Janet Dyer, if you look down in the bottom uh, left-hand corner, there's a close-up of the ovary, the the bit that will become the seed pod. Now, in pure ponticum, those are hairless, completely glabrous, not a single hair. But in at least half of the plants of ponticum you find wild in Britain, you will see some degree of hairiness on those pods and on those ovaries, telling you they are not pure ponticum. They have influence from other species. And generally, my own uh, work on the DNA of the plants shows that it's usually Catorbiensi that has the biggest influence. And we think that cold tolerance came from it at the same time. You can also see genetic and morphological markers of other species. So this is a naturalised plant from the uh, northwest of Scotland near Gairlock. If you look at the uh, corollas, there's a very, very dark patch above the uh, middle of each flower. And you don't see that in pure ponticum. That probably comes from Rhododendron arboreum or possibly even one of the Himalayan species. It's, um, there's all manner of species that could be involved, but uh, I say Catorbiensi is the most important. So it looks as if humans have actually helped the Rhododendron ponticum to invade the British Isles in at least three different ways. First, we brought it here, or brought it back if you prefer, 
Secondly, we disturbed the environment, um, damaged the native vegetation and gave the rhododendron an unfair advantage. And thirdly, we allowed it to um, interbreed with uh, other species in cultivation and make it in the process more suitable to invading the British Isles. And the outcome of all this is after all this Victorian planting, it has just been steadily, steadily spreading and expanding in all sorts of places where it was originally planted. In some places there have been concerted efforts to cull it and drive it back. In others it continues to spread, even in royal estates like Sandringham, the Ponticum has run riot. And it led to this fantastically funny article in the Sunday Sport. That was a now defunct tabloid. Um, but it was back in the days when fake news was actually fun. It was just a form of entertainment rather than uh, a means of supporting dictator-like uh, leaders. Uh, and what I love about this article, if you have a look at it, is that, that all the quotes in it are perfectly genuine and factually accurate. They spread like wildfire, like something out of a horror movie. It's poisonous to mammals, birds and insects, and when it takes hold, everything else dies. We are extremely concerned. The plant has run riot. And, and, and they've, they've spun these genuine quotes into this story that the Queen Mother was in mortal danger from these plants of rhododendron ponticum. Yes, we've seen the ponticum at Windsor. We had no idea it was so dangerous, said a concerned royal workman. Now, the Queen Mother was actually a, a rhododendron aficionado. With her husband, King George VI, she was actually uh, involved in planting rhododendron gardens around uh, Windsor Great Park. I, I can picture her reading this story and, and laughing her head off at it. But yes, uh, obviously, uh, rhododendron ponticum isn't that dangerous to human beings, royal or otherwise, with the exception of those two uh, Irish hikers who nearly came a cropper. Well, I hope that that's been interesting. I uh, hope we've travelled through um, the evolution of rhododendrons. We've talked about their popularity and sometimes their unpopularity. We've uh, looked at their inter their interest from a cultural perspective and indeed from a medical perspective and their their role in myth and even their use as weapons of war and uh, they are utterly utterly fascinating plants and there's still a lot we have to uh, learn about them uh, so my name is dr richard milne and i thank you very much for your attention <laughs>